Imagine yourself in a cocktail party. You're in the middle of a busy crowd. All the guests' voices are merged together. How would you be able to isolate each person's conversation from this auditory mess? What I've described to you is an instance of a general problem called tensor decomposition. This is a picture of a three-dimensional tensor on the top right, a higher dimensional analog of a matrix. And its entries uh, all store these auditory signals together. Tensor decomposition is the problem of approximating this tensor by rank one tensors. In other words, a tensor product of three vectors, A, B, and C. Tensor decomposition is the multilinear analog of a singular value decomposition, or SVD, for matrices, shown in the top left, which is a method of approximating a matrix as a, an outer product of two vectors, A, B transpose. And as many of you know, SVD is the workhorse of principal component analysis, or PCA, for high dimensional data. Now, just like matrices have singular vectors, tensors also have singular vectors. And these are the vectors which provide the best rank one approximation. In my research, I discovered a link between singular vectors of matrices and tensors and quiver representations, shown in the bottom left. A quiver representation is just a directed graph where you place a vector space on a vertex and a linear map on each edge. And just like we can uh, define, um, just like we have singular vectors for matrices and tensors, we can now also talk about uh, singular vectors of quiver representations. So these are assignments of uh, vectors to each vertex, such that whenever you pass them through each edge from the source to the target vertex, you have to get a scalar multiple of the vector at the target vertex, exactly like a singular uh, vector. And quiver representations are, are very important in many areas, such as representation theory and also uh, topological data analysis. So uh, what I'm now exploring is a, a, a hypergraph analog of a quiver representation called a hyperquiver, which looks like this. So just like uh, singular vectors of a quiver, like this one, is a pictorial representation of a rank one SVD of a matrix, this hyperquiver is a pictorial representation of a rank one approximation of a tensor. And this new theory of quiver representations uh, is a lot to be explored, and it can be made ve very general. There's nothing stopping you from drawing any crazy uh, hyperquiver you want. And I'm using algebraic geometry in my research to study the space of singular vectors and therefore tensor decomposition. Hi everyone, I'm Ahavi. I'm a DPhil student with Derek Moulton and Dominic Vela. And today I'm going to be talking about one of my PC projects, which is on the mathematics of balance. So um, basically, humans have several ways of detecting movement and velocities and accelerations. And one of them is located in the vestibular system, which is in our inner ear, very close to our sort of cochlea and our auditive organs. And this comprises a complicated set of semicircular canals and sort of cavities. And in the most important bit is this sort of greenish thing in the middle called the cupular membrane. And what happens is when you sort of move around and you spin, um, the fluid in the center of the duct sort of lags behind because it has inertia and that moves the membrane. The membrane has some innervated hairs down in the center. And when those get moved, you get a signal sent to your brain that says we're moving and uh, that way you can detect movement and sort of do your central nervous system can take decisions, avoid falling, have balance in general. So what we have done is using asymptotics and exploiting the sort of small parameters in the system. We have reduced the, the problem to quadrature, meaning uh, we go from a complicated set of partial differential equations to a single integral differential equation ordinary. So we can just put in a computer, it does it in a second. And one of the nice results, which you can see here on the top right, is that by tuning the stiffness of the membrane, you can capture either the velocity or the acceleration, the angular velocity or the angular acceleration, that is. So here on the bottom, we have uh, a forcing. This just 
means if I start my, my head here and I rotate at 120 degrees, uh, my velocity is going to be the black curve, my acceleration has two peaks, and by increasing the stiffness, this is the response, which is just the deflection of this membrane. I can either tune in to the velocity or the acceleration. I have further sort of performed CFD simulations using commercial software with the entire fluid solid interaction problem to verify the model. And uh, this is still a work in progress. Here's my prototype. We're doing a sort of experimental setup. Uh, this is just on a rotating sort of platform. It, you just have a very similar setup, so just a tube with fluid and a membrane, which is a balloon, and we can sort of rotate that and see if it matches our model. Um, that is all. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed. Hi, um, I'm Sophia, and I'm going to be talking about purely inseparable Galois theory. So first, I need to tell you about Galois theory. And essentially, it's hard, it's trying to understand uh, roots of polynomials. So we started with something of the form x to the fourth minus two. Most of you will have seen that the roots of that have, well, we have the fourth root of two plus minus, but then we have the complex root, so that multiplied by i. And uh, this leads to what we call field extensions, which is we cannot solve this equation um, over the rational numbers, but we can form kind of the smallest thing where we can solve it, and that we write the symbol that like q adjoined for root of two and i. Now, something happens here, which is we I can write that on the right-hand side, but then there's things between the rationals and this, right? So we can write q adjoined i. Since we've already adjoined i, the solutions of the polynomial x squared plus 1, we've already added them. So there's things in between, which we call intermediate extensions. And the idea in Galois theory is that we want to understand these extensions. And it's been known for a long time that this is classified that by the symmetries of this extension. And by symmetries, I mean that we can swap these solutions in a way that induces um, a symmetry on q-adjoined uh, all of those roots. Now, what I work on is something called purely inseparable extensions. So instead of working with the rational numbers, we work over some field f, where um, we fix a prime number, which is equal to 0. Now, kind of a feature slash bug of this is that if we take p roots for this prime number, that's the same way when we take square roots, that's always a plus minus. Now, there's only going to be one solution. So the kind of extensions I work in, um, what happens is we only adjoin p roots in this setting. So any of these polynomials only has one solution. The problem with this, then, is that there's only going to be once um, we can't have any of those symmetries, because as I said, we swap around the solutions, and that is what induces the symmetries that helps us to understand. So we can't play the same game as before to understand the intermediate extensions. And that forces us to go to algebraic geometry. And it really comes here to save the day, is where we turn these algebraic objects into geometric objects. Now, the slightly underwhelming bit of this talk is if we take f and we turn it into a geometric object, it turns into a point. Um, but that is not very interesting in itself, and that's why we try to deform it. By deforming it, and that's what I mean by those little arrows there, is that in every direction, which is an infinitesimal deformation, so like a really tiny amount that is kind of consistent all around it. And we can actually do that, like these sort of intermediate extensions is the same thing as trying to deform this spec f, this geometric object. So now, in this setting, instead of talking about the symmetries, we have to talk about the deformations. In particular, my thesis, what it does, is that sometimes we join infinitely many of these p roots. And you do this infinitely many times, and then you still have a point, but it's like a very complex point. And you have an infinite space of deformations. So some of the points in the space of deformations, they clutter up, and there's some distance between them, there's some notion of closeness. And the goal, essentially, is trying to understand how this closeness, this notion of distance, can help us understand these intermediate extensions. Thank you. New cancer drugs are expensive. The mean cost of developing an FDA-approved cancer drug is $4.4 billion. So we'd like to do more with the drugs that we have. And in particular, the drugs that we have don't work forever. Treatment response is typically transient. The treatment works for some amount of time and then stops working. And so we want to try and make the most of the time where a patient will respond to our cancer treatment. Now, this question has already been addressed in a very different context, crop management. In 1914, farmers in Washington noticed a significant decrease in yields due to a new pest called San Jose scale, which was resistant to the traditional sulfur lime, in sulfur lime insecticides that they used. They tried switching to oil-based insecticides, but the benefit only lasted a few years before a new variant of this scale emerged 
that was doubly resistant to both, both insecticides. So an ecologist proposed a different strategy. They should spray the, insect, the, uh, the pesticides less frequently and use less pesticide so that they could keep around some of the original pests that weren't, that weren't immune to their pesticide and that, they, and that would then compete with the pesticide that was doubly immune. This drew on ideas introduced by Charles Darwin in um, Natural Origin of Species and in Evolutionary Theory, that species compete with each other and that we can use the species that do respond to our drug to control the species that don't. This approach was incredibly successful and now in US law it's mandated that you have um, regions of crop that are insecticide free so that we keep um, the rest of the regions responding to our insecticide. We can replicate this approach in cancer by prescribing breaks in our treatment so the tumour can resensitise to our applied treatment mechanism and, um, and, keep the, and keep the patient responding to the drug. And this also has the added benefit that it can reduce side effects for the patient. But where does maths come into this? Well, we can use ordinary differential equation models fitted to clinical data and an optimal control theory to tailor those breaks in our treatment to individual patients and optimise the treatment schedule for them. We can also consider the ecology of the tumour as well. Tumours are not spatially heterogeneous and by considering how those drug sensitive and drug resistant cells are organised within the tumour, we find that we can then improve and we can characterise different diseases and improve outcomes for patients. And we can do this using agent based models and spatial statistics. We're now working to try and translate these approaches to the clinic to replicate the success of the Washington Farmers over 100 years later in cancer patients. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm doing a master's dissertation and it's on pre and post selection paradoxes and how we can evade them by appealing to causal structure. So first of all, let's understand what is a pre and post selection system. We talk about pre and post selection when we start with a system in a certain quantum state. We prepare it, for example, in the quantum state psi at time t1. And then we only restrict our study on the systems that would be measured at a state phi at time t2 and we discard everything else. So if we prepare at psi and then we get some other measurement that is not phi, we just discard it, and we only study systems where we get phi at the end. Now, the questions that we might ask is, if we perform a measurement at a time t, that, it, that is between t1 and t2, what would be the outcome of that measurement? Um, some people studied this question and they came up with this rule called the ABL rule on which you see the formula and the formula is pretty simple, it's based on base formula and what we have there is just a projector representing the projector that is related to the certain state that you're trying to measure um, in like in between T1 and T2, sandwiched between uh, the two states that you prepare and you post select afterwards and you divide it by all of the other possibilities. But when we use this rule, sometimes we get some paradoxes. For example, if we get an example, like imagine you have a particle and you, pu you put the particle in one of these three boxes um, and you prepare it in a certain state, psi, and then you measure it in another state, phi. I didn't put the particular states that lead to the paradox, but in some, in some configurations of pre and post selection states, when you measure the probability of that particle being in the first box, you get it with certainty in that box. But when you measure it being in the second box, you also get it with certainty in the second box, which gives us the paradox. I personally speaking do not think it's a paradox for other reasons, but that's why it's called a paradox. And some of the explanations that are given to us by standard quantum theory is that measurements are disturbing and the cho choice of the box is what gave us this measurement. However, if we study the system under the consistent history's formalism, which is another quantum interpretation that, that is based on a completely different idea that is not measurement, we ignore measurements and obser observations and whatever, and we just uh, study ontological states of systems and consider like events of like what the system was in, then we still get the same probability and we get the same paradox. In my dissertation, I am going to study these paradoxes under bubble theory, a new quantum interpretation that is based on consistent histories, but you add on top of it a new condition that is based on causal structure. 
And this new condition, I don't think I have enough time to explain it, but it's based on interference influence influences. And that is what I represent in that bottom right corner diagram, which is representing what, how can we have A not have any interference influence on system D, uh, considering that we have a unitary between systems A and B and C and D. And this bubble theory, my, my, okay. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I don't have time to say more about, yeah. All right, uh, let me introduce you to a new, fun, and exciting subject in mathematics. It starts with a question. What can happen and what cannot happen? Who can answer such a question? Well, it turns out that we can formalize it. Suppose you have a group G. Um, does your group have an element of order 7? Easy. Now, is there a morphism that can take your group to a new group where, um, that actually has this element of order 7, and therefore making the original group a group where it's possible? So this idea generalizes and in fact is so universal that, so to speak, um, the possibilities are endless. You have applications in category theory, model theory, set theory. Recently, um, computability theories became interested. Graph, fields, groups, orders are all very fruitful for this sort of inquiry. And in fact, um, the questions are appearing left and right and ranging from very easy to very hard. Now let me turn to uh, model graph theory, which is particularly interesting. So here, phi will be possible if there is a super graph where phi is true. Now every graph satisfies that possibly there is a node whose neighbors um, are a finite chain or a z chain, both of which are expressible in model graph theory. Um, let's now tweak it a little bit and we can do it in such a way that not all groups satisfy it, but um, groups um, get characterized by whether they're finite, countable, infinite, and so on. So we can actually express that my uh, graph is infinite, which is not possible in the standard graph theory. Uh, and in fact, it can capture particularly all the mathematics, unless you are a set theorist, then maybe that's not really true. Now, in model group theories, um, there are many morphisms that are interesting, but let's stick to embeddings. Here we also have statements that are normally not expressible, but with model vocabulary, they become expressible. For example, that G is torsion element. And in fact, we can study computability um, theory in groups now. Now, the last thing I want to tell you about is the maximality principle, which is an action schema that says everything that is possibly necessary is already true. Now, not every structure satisfies it, but if it does, it's probably very important. As you can see, probably fields um, are algebraically closed. Now, there is a generalization in set theory that connects the missing axiom of set theory with the stronger maximality principle. Thank you.